Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and before we start just a couple of announcements. The first thing is I am actively looking for food over medicine instructors and women's health instructors and I have a great certification course at the end of it. Um, you get uh, slides and materials to facilitate teaching the class. Um, I'll list you on my website as a food over medicine instructor. So if you're interested in that, send me an email at pampopper at msn.com. We can set up a time to talk about it. I'll send you some information. And then we're really in the countdown now, just three weeks until our conference here in Columbus, November 13 through 15. Go to our website at wellnessforum.com and watch the video that's posted there about these incredible guests. And in the next few days, we'll be posting some interviews, some short little interviews with the speakers so you can get a flavor for what they're all about. So um, you don't want to, you don't want to be, not be here November 13 or 15 and then look at stuff on social media and that sort of thing and say, oh gosh, I wish I'd gone. It looks like they're having so much fun and learning so much cool stuff and you know, all that. So well, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so there's a couple things to talk about today, starting with the placebo effect. Um, research on antidepressants and other psychiatric drugs, very flawed. You've heard me talk about this a lot. Study design is poor, selection bias is common, manipulation of data, and outright fraudulent reporting of data is common. Just a week or two ago, I did a video clip, uh, one of these clips on the uh, reanalysis of the data on Paxil for adolescents, and um, it, it's just appalling to me. And none of the people who are involved in uh, the re fraudulent reporting or nothing's happening to them, at least at this point in time. But there's another issue that is equally difficult, and that is that the response to placebo is as high as 50% in depressed and anxious patients, about the same as the response to antidepressants. So I think it's a fair question to say, what are we doing giving patients psychiatric drugs that aren't any better than doing nothing? Placebo is doing nothing. And of course, doing nothing doesn't have negative side effects the way that drugs, some of these drugs, have horrific side effects. Well, a recent study looking at the placebo effect for depressed patients was conducted by a group that has done a lot of research on the placebo effect uh, for many years, during the last 10 years. And previous studies conducted by the group showed that the brain's natural painkiller system, called the Mu opioid system, changed when people received a placebo. So for this study, the group took 35 patients with major depression who hadn't been treated in any way prior to the study. They weren't told about the purpose of the study until after it was over. The patients either took a placebo, which they were told was a fast-acting antidepressant, this is called the active placebo, or they were given a placebo, which they were told was a placebo. After each week, the patients had PET scans, during which they were given an IV with salt water, and what they were told about this is that it was effective for relieving symptoms uh, quickly, symptoms of depression. So um, people thought they were getting drugs that were helpful. After two weeks, the patients were given a real antidepressant, then they were followed for a total of 10 weeks. During the entire study period, the patients reported their uh, depressive symptoms based on a standard measurement method. Most patients responded to the placebo, and those who did, interestingly enough, were more likely to respond well to the drug. The researchers explained that the placebo triggered the brain's innate chemical responses against depression. People who didn't respond to the placebo also didn't po respond very positively when they were given the drugs. The researchers concluded that 43% of the antidepressant treatment uh, result is a result of the placebo effect. According to a researcher, uh, to researcher John Carr Zubeda, the placebo effect was based on a couple of things. One was the participants' belief that they were taking a drug, and then just from being in a treatment environment. In other words, the act of seeking and getting help is therapeutic, even aside from any treatment that's actually offered. And I'd actually read about this before. Um, there's a great book called Artificial Happiness written by Ron Dworkin, who's a PhD in public health, I think, and a medical doctor. And um, he talks about the ill-advised strategy of medicating patients for depression. But uh, one study that he cited in that book um, was about patients who went to their family doctor and just talked about their issues. Um, the doctor says, how are you doing? Not so good, I'm getting divorced, and you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and they all rated themselves as feeling better just after talking about these things with their doctor. So there is some value in just doing something um, that you perceive as making yourself better. 
The findings of this study, combined with the results of hundreds of others, should signal the end of drugging people with psychological issues. Responders respond just as well to placebo as drugs, and those who don't respond to the placebo don't respond to the drugs so well. So drugs are unnecessary for the folks that respond to placebo, and they certainly are worthless for the people who don't. So um, it, uh, it is true, however, that most people respond well to cognitive therapy, no negative side effects of that if you're dealing with a good practitioner. Uh, but um, I, unfortunately, I don't see the situation changing. There's just too much money in this uh, seven minute visit and a psychiatric drug or some meager attempt at talk therapy followed by a psychiatric drug. We're not gonna change it anytime soon. We just have to educate people that um, most of the value of any of this stuff is placebo effects, so stay away from the side effects um, uh, of taking drugs. All right, another issue. Discussion about gluten and grains is confusing to consumers. I, I kind of get a feel for what's confusing to consumers because these are the things I get emails about on almost a daily basis. And so people read all these things in consumer publications and books. And so you've got a couple of camps here. You've got the anti-grain folks. These are the paleo grain brain, wheat belly folks who say everybody should stay away from all grains without any scientific documentation to support their stance. They, um, they tell people to uh, avoid grains because they're the cause of most health issues. I did an advanced study course on grain brain and um, we pulled up every reference, uh, such as they were. I kind of smiled because Peril Muter's idea of well-referenced is certainly isn't mine, but, but um, we found that most of his references didn't support his statements, and I'm doing an advanced study on wheat belly in December, and we've already pulled up all of his references, uh, William Davis's references, and not surprisingly, they don't support his stance either. But uh, anyway, they're wrong about this. I think the research is clear on the issue. On the other side are some physicians, uh, many of whom discount the role of nutrition at all, who insist that unless you have celiac disease, no reason to consider gluten in particular as being a problem. Well, the term for gluten-induced symptoms in patients who don't have celiac disease is called non-celiac gluten sensitivity, or NCGS. And a growing body of research is actually starting to show that there is such a thing and that it deserves some attention in a clinical setting. A randomized double-blind placebo-controlled crossover trial was conducted to determine the effects of gluten intake on patients who were suspected of having NCGS. So the researchers enrolled 61 patients who didn't have celiac disease or, or diagnosable wheat allergy, who said, reported, that they were sensitive to gluten. They claimed to have both intestinal and other symptoms after consuming it. The participants were randomly assigned to consume 4.375 grams of gluten per day, or rice starch as a placebo, uh, for one week, and they got it in capsules. After eating a gluten-free diet for one week, then they crossed over uh, to the other group. 59 patients completed the study, and for those, gluten significantly increased symptoms as compared to placebo. The subjects reported that abdominal bloating and pain, foggy mind, oral canker sores, and depression were significantly more severe when they consumed the gluten when the, versus when they consumed the placebo. And by the way, the amount of gluten in the capsule that generated the symptoms was the equivalent of eating about a slice of some type of regular bread per day. So not a huge amount of gluten necessary to trigger the symptoms. Well, here's what, what, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this. When I started investigating dietary causes of inflammatory bowel disease many years ago, I found dozens of articles reporting that gluten restriction improved symptoms. Uh, some studies included surveys of IBD patients, and they almost always reported that gluten restriction helped them. Um, and so we started to include gluten restriction in our IBD protocol here. And what we hear all the time from people who have, um, have been through this program is that uh, there are symptoms resolved, many of them are able to get off medications with their doctor's help and that sort of thing. But when they eat something with gluten, their symptoms quickly return. So this study and others like it justify our recommendation to recommend gluten restriction for some people who don't have celiac disease, but either have determined on their own that gluten is a problem uh, and causes symptoms or have conditions in which we know there's a high probability. So um, again, a lot of crazy camps out there are making polarizing statements about it. The answer, as usual, is someplace in the middle where we take everything into consideration. And so there are some people who should restrict gluten-containing foods. All right, that's all for today. Uh, as usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you on Thursday with more news.